good afternoon i request all of you right from the advisory pair
Dr. Sridhi, head of the Department of Plastic Surgery, and the speaker of the day, Dr. Sridhi, Dr. Mahapatra, Dr. Vijay, Dr. Padma Lakshmi, and other faculty, students, staff, and those uh, who are participating uh, remotely. Very good afternoon. And I welcome you all for today's Dipma uh, Lecture CC. Dipma has been uh, organizing the lecture when an opportunity comes and uh, to continue the part of the continuing medical program here. Dipma is a regional resource center for South India and also for Bimstek country. This program is being uh, live telecasted uh, nationally as well as uh, globally. So I welcome you all the nodal officers as well as the other participants who are participating. The topic of the day is very, very important, uh, not only for the uh, practicing plastic surgeons, but also for the residents, because there is no MCH exam possible without a case of uh, recal plexus or some of the other kind of a question which is asked. So hence, uh, this topic is very close to most of us. Jipper has been uh, regularly doing recal plexus surgery and our professor, Dr. Dinesh, now he is in emergency case, regularly doing four or five cases in a month with other teams and other consultants. Ah. The outline of the program, as all of you can see, uh, we will have a lecture by the speaker, and then we'll have a question-answer session, followed by the qualification and distribution of certificates. And then we'll have a group photograph. At the time of question and answer, uh, participants, those who are remotely participating, can pose their question in the chat box and it will be taken here for the speaker. So let me formally introduce the speaker of the day, uh, Professor Dr. Veena Kesri. At present, she is working in the Department of uh, Burns and Plastic Surgery at uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Patna Bihar. She is also Deputy Medical Superintendent and a member of uh, Medical Education Unit. She is very well known among all the APSI members and very dynamic and active member of APSI. She is the currently executive member of APSI and course director of APSI PG Medical Education Program and also webinar coordinator of NABI. She is a very well known and dynamic speaker and has been giving her TED head talk. And also, she is a FIMR fellow awarded in 2021. She has received many awards, including Award of Excellence for Outstanding Contribution Toward APSI Post Graduate Medical Education Program, and also for the Burns Education Program, and also was awarded Women Excellence Award the Department and President Appreciation Award from IMA Bihar and Good Samitan Award from Bihar Dental Policy. This topic is very close to our heart and also, she has been actively involved in microsurgery, breast reconstruction, medical education program. Uh, we are thankful to Madam that she accepted the our request of delivery and uh, giving lectures to all the PGs and the other faculty. So, thank you very much, Madam, and I request you to uh, deliver your talk. Over to you, Madam.
thank you so much, Dr. Rani, for joining us. Very warm welcome to all the faculty members, all the course members, and all the delegates who have joined online. It is my honor and privilege to deliver a lecture lecture series in the department of plastic and that too on a topic very close to my heart that is already greatest lecture thank you so please accept my greetings from in so i will be talking on the nerve transfer related to injury the approaches algorithm and advances so the most important thing for the pg is to know that how to decide first is how to decide what is the clinical diagnosis of a brittle pressure patient what should be the mode of treatment and what are the follow up treatment so keeping in uh, that in view the entire overview of my presentation would focus on the clinical evaluation and algorithm for decision making approaches for nerve transfer in various types of clinical presentation and also what are the recent surgical techniques that have evolved over the time in the area of nerve transfer so i'll be speaking mainly to the nerve transfer i won't go into details about the muscle or the tendon so let's first start with the clinical evaluation and decision making we all know that in brittle pressure patient the examination involves examination of more than 50 muscles Starting from proximal to distal, you have a various small or larger muscles which you need to examine to come to a diagnosis. So why do you do the thorough exam? Because you have to localize them. You have to see the extent of the muscle and the severity of it because your plan will depend upon these three factors. So keep these three factors in your mind and before proceeding for an examination, you should have thorough understanding. Of the anatomy, at what level the roots are um, taken up, which roots are originally from the spinal cord, what level the trunk, the cords, and the branches are forming and supplying the muscle. So, a better way to examine the facial structure is to go in a sequence. Sequence can be from proximal to distal. You will start with the root, proceed towards the trunk, the region, cords, and the branches. So, a very generalized overview of how to localize the lesion if it is called root so you should know you are all aware that facial pressure is originated from root of t5 to t1 ventral nerve root of t5 to t1 so if you are setting a deltoid for the shoulder abduction you are targeting t5 if elbow flexion which is brought by the action of biceps it is t6 For C7, you will be setting the action biceps and the wrist tensor, and C8 would be extensing hand muscle, and C1 would be inferior. If I am talking in context to root only, so examining these muscles, you have to take care that if a root is involved, what is happening? What are the steps which needs to be followed? You have to properly expose the entire upper torso of the patient. Look carefully towards the attitude of the limb. You know, in upper trunk palsy, that is the upper palsy, the patient has a greater stick upon it or a quarter stick upon it. So just keep that thing in your mind that the entire arm will be adapted, internally rotated, and also the elbow will be extended. So that is the greater stick upon it. So look for the attitude, as in any of the hand examination or the lower limb examination, you will start with the earlier examination with the attitude. Here also, you just check the what is the attitude and mention it in your paper. The area where muscle rotates starts from the shoulder, go up to the finger. Then also, if there are any scars from the trauma or any previous surgical intervention, just have the examination part part in quite detail. And I am again not going into detail that scar inspection, operation, and size and the all the Thickness and the color, everything is put more to you. Then the suppleness of the soft tissue, which is available, and also if any contracture, big contracture, or any restriction in the movement of the joint tissue. And in cases where articulated history of fracture is there, you would look for the bony abnormality, because most of the greater cases.
So, okay, in the general examination, I was telling you that you have to look for the body abnormalities also. There is an associated clavicular or humor fracture. So, then look for the faces, at the faces of the patient. You have to decide here only during the inspection if it is a case of free ganglion. So free ganglionic, you know that corner syndrome is present. You have to look for the telltale sign of corner syndrome. And it indicates that there is a lower tract. As the T1 sympathetic ganglion is very close to the T1 ganglion. So uh, in the pre ganglionic mission, you will be also uh, looking for the injury to phrenic nerve. Go for a chest X-ray in a full expiration and full expiration. Try to look for the level of your diaphragm. In expiration, you all know that the diaphragm goes down. In expiration, diaphragm will go up. So just count the ribs and see at what level the diaphragm is there, at what rib level, and just try to get a diagnosis if there is no change in the level of the Diaphragm uh, in both the views, or if you feel like that still the diaphragm is elevated in both the full expression and expiration only, it indicates that there is no phrenic nerve injury. But if it is a phrenic nerve injury, it is a case of pre-ganglionic. So to establish the diagnosis of pre-ganglionic, you also have to look for the involvement of the homeboy system and the system. To check the action of the dorsal the the and the non Next slide. So you see the Horner syndrome, like if there is decrease in the size of the pupillary aperture and the meiosis and anhydrosis is there and ophthalmos is there, the size of the animal also looks smaller than this one. You go for checking female sisters and female. Just gently tap in the area of the ischemic rectangle and below the cavity. If the patient complains of pain and tingling sensation all throughout the limb, it means tenesis positive. And tenesis positive means there is a rupture. If 
synesis absent, the root aversion is present. So these are small, small things you are gradually going towards making a diagnosis, whether it is a pre-pandionic or a post-pandionic, whether it is an aversion injury or a rupture injury, because treatment management plan differs for these kinds of injuries. On the shoulder, look for this hollowness just beneath the shoulder. If there is a hollowness present, it is called sulfur. A sulfur sign indicates the glenohumeral instability. Most of the time, the, even the orthopedician or the patient also comes with like my shoulder seems to be dislocated. So it is no dislocation. Rule out all the associated injuries of the shoulder joint. And then if you see this, then you have a diagnosis of glenohumeral instability. So that you don't have to do anything during the break of the Not to localize the lesion. There is it, either at the root level or the trunk or the fall level. So this is just a sequence made for the examining. You will go with the rhombus and serratus to localize the lesion at the root level. Then you will examine the sinus to see whether the lesion is located in the trunk. And then for the cords, you will look for the action of tech. A muscle, the subscapularis, and the latissimus dot. Your idea is to get the diagnosis. You can follow any sequence you want, but do not go half of that. You have to follow one sequence. So, for rhombus examination, you stand on the back point of the patient and try to palpate the muscle in the small of the back between the two scapular bones. You will put your hands and you will palpate along the vertebrae. You want to push, give some resistance, then you ask the patient to lift his hand off the back. And then you see whether the underlying muscle is lifting, is pushing your fingers or not. So you can check against resistance also. For the serratus anterior, you know pushing the wall sign is there. You ask the patient to push the wall with both the hands and look for the waving of the And you see, can see in this photograph that the patient is having a waving of his hand. For the trunk, when we are supposed to examine the suprascapular joint, we will look for the absence of suprascapular and infraspinatus. So, suprascapular, you ask the patient to adjust to 90 degrees and try to put a resistance uh, in a downward direction and check for the um, attraction, the power of the attraction which we are doing. And for the infraspinatus, the arm is set alongside the body. And the resistance is given from the lateral side towards the major, and you ask the patient to just laterally, externally rotate the forearm, and you can check the power to the forearm. You have to check the action and teach the muscles separately, both the sternal head and the clavicle of the technician, because their uh, contribution of the medial technician and lateral different uh, So uh, you can see in this picture that the external head of the patient, you ask the patient to relax the force from your hand and then you start try to check the muscle, just lateral to the You will get to uh, feel the outness, the shortness of the clavicular head, you go just the you will check the action of latissimus dorsum and you again ask the patient to relax the forearm anterior head and you check for the process of the posterior ancillary bone. Tell me that against resistance point, so you ask the patient to keep adapted and you have no resistance. Branches. We have completed the root, trunk, and the trunk. For the branches, this can be one sequence which is followed. For admitting the flow for for multiple you will check the bicep muscle level. For radial nerve, you will check the action of crisis and the central muscle for and so like the medial muscle. So for you check the action of both the fibers of anterior dorsal and the posterior dorsal. Just ask the patient to sit, relax his forearm, and you. Try to ask me to answer, and you put the pressure on the lateral aspect of the bone to check the passenger. And if you are 
and putting the pressure on the posterior aspect of the arm when you are checking the posterior tension. So, since why this is important, because axillary nerve could divide into one to three anterior branches and one posterior. When they separately supply the anterior fibers and the posterior fibers. So, just to, uh, if the um, injury is at the branches level, sometimes what happens is the starchy fibers. So, one of the fibers might be there. So, you have to check the anterior and the posterior delta separately. Then, for the maximum retainment, you know that biceps does get in the dimensional direction and in the mid zone, it gets the transition. So, that's the function of the bracelet. Well, I just did not have the data on the Okay, so just tell that sometimes the greater reading is more than the patient is able to do some elbow testing. So you have to believe that it is not the elbow testing, it is brought by the muscular feeling. Radial for crisis, alpha, test for the power, and you have to actually break one of the power into the Check for the risk extension and the extension of the infection. For the medium nerve, actually these all nerves we supply on the small distance of the nerve. So you cannot check each and every uh, muscle, especially during the exam. If you want to localize your, uh, if you want to identify whether the medium nerve or something was called or not, this is just two or three tests to be quickly done to establish the nerve. So medium nerve, if you do the you can also check the options of the long distance. Yes, you know the section of the field. So you have to check them separately. For the other years, you will particularly go for checking the middle distance. Then you can go for the smart test or the So if you want to have your diagnosis kit, at least take two or three tests which are very specific of that nerve therapy and uh, then you can uh, diagnose it quickly. Once you have done all the nerve examination at various levels, do not miss to check your donor nerves. This is for the examination purpose also and for your clinical care purpose. So check for the action of the cases, which is supplied by extra and accessory, and for Spanish I have already told you, you also check for the intercontinent. You just ask the patient a history of either chest injury or a rib fracture or a hemothorax or hemothorax. The of the intercontinent. That means that whichever space the ICD was placed, it means that somewhere that the space is not different because you require all these factors. We also go for checking the contralation C7 nerves also to check for the action of the action of pectoralis. So this way you can check the trapezius, you go behind the patient and this so all these patients when you are checking the doing the examination of the various muscles of the side by the ventral plexus, you first actually examine the normal. So that the patient understands what he is supposed to do. And then you go and check it on the objective sum and compare the power. This is a number function assessment chart. Uh, in terms of happy Ravi Kitoya for showing me that Dr. Dinesh has been doing lots of pressure sessions. So you all are aware about this functional assessment chart. Every center has their own chart. This is just a template. So where you are supposed to document. The examination finding of each and every muscle starting from the team to the person. This is a mandatory document. And to go in your file, to go with the discharge paper, and accordingly you do the follow up of the So keep doing these things. It seems a very complex or a serious job, but this will make your job also easy. And whoever is following in the next OPD visit of the patient, it will become easier for the doctor. So you see examination after you have done this uh, motor examination, let's try to localize the lesion according to the dermal map. So as you, you can see in this picture, that C4 is supplying the area of the shoulder, and C5 is all the lateral of 
So this basically uh, differentiates the pleasure from the whether it is a root injury or it is of the other injury. And also it is important for the follow-up. The fourth one is the cortical sensory evoker. It also is available, you must do it, uh, you must get it back before the surgery also and during the surgery. So uh, the cortex which is uh, being uh, which is uh, representing the brachial plexus, you can actually record the symptoms there. So now, once you have done the investigation, you have made the diagnosis, how are you going to decide what option for fixation? So there comes the indication. You have to remember three secrets. And these are the three most common. There are supposed to immediately need as to the brachial plexus extension and possibly reflex. So if the cases are open penetration, start if something has happened, then you have no confusion about it. A patient with such a situation over table one, diagnosis of brachial plexus injury, you are going to ask me the patient is taken up. Associated vascular injury, because you know that even the plexus area will be opened after insertion of artery or any other major vascular injury. Just go and see the plexus because the patient is already taken up for the other area. So these are two conditions where you will have to act in But under the treatment, so you have some time. So of the MRI, there is no when it is all generalized. The paralysis is wrong because it's a case of data. But these are the findings you are getting on. The clinical or on the radiological. If it, problem, if it is a case of post January, you can wait for three to five to five months. Uh, these are the uh, cases where we go for the delayed pseudomeningosis are uh, at many levels. You know if it's a root application and you do not expect survival factors. And at multiple levels, the flexion. So you wait. At least some part where there will be less injury, it will be. So all these are indications for delayed. Delayed means after So and but these cases are of root as you can see that it is pseudo meningosis are there, but it is only normal to the upper trunk or the trunk at the same level, uh roots at the same level. You go for it earlier at three months. So rest of the cases you can go after five months. In cases of room diversion, you have to explore after a few months, especially those global sectors. So what is the surgical option? You have come to know about the indication. When you do surgery, you have to So what are the options? So these are the options you are aware of. Which of these are your options in your arm and you have to use it according to the individual so let's come to our approach in upper trunk. Upper trunk is involvement of C5 complexes, leading to loss of shoulder abduction and pelvic. So you can see if the injury time is from six to nine months. The literature says that you can go up to nine months. But the ideal time is that you have to react according to the timeline as it stands for the of the patient. So if the patient is coming at five months, you go for five months or five months. So up to nine months, you can go for the Okay. Because all these nerve transfers are done very close to the brain, and that's why this is have to take care. Even clinically, also, you get to see good results in cases of nerve transfers, even if it is in the case of five, ten months. So you still have much time. So the shoulder adduction, we do two long terms. Okay, and for elbow flexion, another two long term. So we say four long faster in the case of adduction. So the shoulder adduction one is you can never be either with the it depends upon when works are what is the practice at 
So in the beginning, I will see a room with later on for the last four or five years, we have seen it over the posterior road because of the better results. So we also have to know that the branch of uh, radial nerve, which is behind the long head of the head, is being neurotized to the axillary. So they are going to be the raking the delivery. So supra-rotator cuff muscles, that is the supra-spinator and infra-spinator by elevation of the transcapulus, who are very far back. So that is always a better. So all upper term is to perform these two more transfers for the shoulder. So it is very clear, you go for open. Open in school is very good for both the medium and the and you can use one practical of each to tie the muscular fitting branch, one going to the bulk, another going to the brain. When the patient is late, comes after nine months, then you have no option, you have to go for massage. And for shoulder, you know most commonly is the trending case. Sometimes it is a small part of the procedure along with the case, maybe along with the massage. The ideal one is the specialist. You can also go for a pedicle bipolar uh, pectoralis major on a left. These are the options. So, this is one picture which I am sharing with you regarding your anterior upload. In the next side photograph, it is a classical incision for anterior upload. So, we are also combining exploration of the pleasure along with the nerve. Plan to explore the nerve. Like if you feel like uh, uh, there is a, you, there can be patchy injury, there is a neurotype. And I also want to do some external neuronization. You go for a classical injection. And along with that, you But uh, in some cases where you have not planned for exploration, some literature and some centers they recommend a routine exploration. Sometimes it is uh, it can, uh, there are some also fields that uh, in cases uh, where you only plan for directly nerve transfer, then there is no unnecessary need of exploration of the cluster. So in cases of only nerve transfer, you go for a transfer cervical. That is cosmetically better as compared to the cervical. In the second picture, I have just shown you how the nerves look like through a transfer cervical. Even when you are uh, planning for using spinal accessory or as a donor for the free functional transfer, then also you go for the uh, transfer injection. So you see that supracapular nerve is the most lateral nerve from the flexor. And uh, you know all the steps of the flexor system. You have a free extra flexor uh, fat that just remove it and see the only you will cut or reflect them and beneath it that you will see your Once you have visualized the flexes, you can see the suprastapular. If you do not want to explore, you don't need to touch the flexes at all. You can simply go for looking for the hyoid muscle and the transverse cervical vessel, and you can see your suprastapular. All throughout the surgery, you can use, you must uh, use the electrical nerve. In our days, there used to be no nerve stimulation. So we were totally dependent on the anatomy. But nowadays, you have very good nerve stimulation. All of this we draw. So you can use it and you can cut on. Most of the time, what happens is that the nerve which is damaged, that won't show any contraction in the uh, muscle. Like if you stimulate the suprastapular, you won't see any action in the suprastapular. So it might also happen, especially in cases uh, who are presenting late or the motor inflammation. So all these things you have to keep in mind that whose prognosis are 
So if some of the motor endplates are viable, then you will obviously get a good successful result. But if nothing is stimulating, no fibers are functioning, then you have to keep a target protein. And in the spinal FTC now, you simply go and look for that protein insertion into the and there you can just go beneath the trapezium and put a 2.5 centimeter from its anterior on the undersurface. You will find a very good spinal access in your Look for it external. That go very proximate. Otherwise, you will be denervating the anterior anterior trapezium. And if you will require that muscle for the muscle later on, then you are in a problem with this. Yes. So the distal most uh, branch of this uh, and try to as much as you require for a tension free conversation. So I don't have the free of the photograph of this patient because we don't uh, routinely do anterior reference. This was our initial patient in which we uh, got a good result. And even now and then we do sometimes anterior approach when the patient reports very early, very early. Like in cases uh, uh, where they report uh, around three months, uh, and uh, by all those criteria, we know that uh, this cannot be a place of delayed exploration. We have to intervene. And sometimes I go for anterior exploration. Anterior uh, approach you have to follow in cases where there is a scapular fracture or a colored joint fracture, or uh, uh, in the area where uh, your suprascapular nerve is supposed to be found, there is some sort of injury. So you expect fibrosis. And it's starting and bleeding. So there also you try to go from an So your approach is be as easier as the answer. Not much of technical differences are there. You just have to be well watched with the anatomy. So uh, as you can see in the marking for the posterior approach, you simply draw a midline, and from the line you palpate that transverse process of C7. But C7 vertebra, once you have palpated, you draw a line from the transverse process up to the abdomen. And 40% at the junction of 40% and 60% of the this line, your spinal in line. It will be like supplying the posterior fibers of trapezius and most of the distal most branches you will be getting. And then for suprascapular, you will draw another line along the scapular spine from the medial edge of the scapula up to the acromion process. And midway between this, uh, on this line, you like your suprascapular nerve. So, this is also very easy. Spinal activity you will get within uh, 10 to 15 inches. You put the identity minutes, you expose skin, you add it. And on the under surface, you will see that. So not much of a problem. Then uh, for the uh, suprascapular, for the suprascapular nerve, you have to look for the suprascapular nerve. That is a bit tricky. If you have not done any cadaveric dissection, then it becomes a difficult. So in the same plane where you found Uh, once you cut it, your suprascapular nerve is there. So it is also uh, easier. And uh, the advantages of this approach is that the advantages of this approach, one I told you uh, that you will be doing the renovation close to the muscle where the suprascapular nerve is entering into the supraspinatus muscle, you will be going as close to. So your time for renovation will be less as compared to the anterior approach. This is the most, most advantageous benefit. Why is not losing? So closer to the muscle. So less of renovation time. So if a patient who is presenting at six, seven, eight, nine months also, you can always go via the posterior approach. 
Then there are other advantages also that you are preserving the more proximal branches of the spinal accessory nerve. As I told you, in one or two cases, we got to see the atrophy of the trapezius muscle in the anterior approach. So that was also one reason why we switched over to the posterior approach. And then you are aware that the suprascapular nerve can have double nerve injury. Even maybe at the level of the root or the trunk, the other in the suprascapular notch. Because there is a very small space and if there is some fracture or some compression, some trauma at that side, then the nerve is also crushed in the suprascapular notch. So when you are doing the coaptation anteriorly, you might not get any. So that is one, again, more important, a very important result. And uh, the final thing is for the SOMSAT transfer. Why we prefer this posterior approach for a spinal accessory and suprascapular transfer is that there is also a preferred approach, posterior approach for SOMSAT transfer. So it becomes easier without changing the position. We can do both the nerve transfers in this way only. So SOMSAT transfer always I do with a posterior approach only. And uh, the incision, you mark it from the acromion process up to the mid of the arm in between the triceps and the deltoid. So it is a longitudinal incision. You just go and identify your triceps muscle, your deltoid muscle, retract the deltoid laterally, triceps medially, and you will be able to, first what you will be able to see is a cutaneous branch of the axial vein, a very small and a thin branch. And if you will retrace it proximally, you will be able to see the branching of the axial vein. So as I told you, there are one, two, three anterior branches. Try to identify one of the branch, which is the thickest and the longest. And then when you will move distally in the same plane, do not change your plane. It's very important. If you change your plane, you will not, you will be lost and you will not be able to do the coaptation also. So in the same plane, when you will go distally, under the surface of the triceps, you will find uh, uh, the radial nerve, the branches. There will be branching to both the long head, short head, and the medial head. You identify the branch which is going to the long. Proximally, you will be able to identify the quadrilateral space also from where the axillary nerve is coming. And uh, there also you can go and identify. So once or twice done, if there is a cadaver available, I would strongly recommend first go for the anatomical dissection in a cadaver. If not, you can go very slowly, keep a picture of the entire dissection in your mind and go very slowly, try to identify, stimulate them, make them free to have a tension-free coaptation. That is very much important. So this, was, uh, this is just a picture of one of the patients who underwent both the nerve transfer for shoulder adduction. Actually, he went a four nerve transfer because it was a case of upper trunk palsy. So you can see that his left uh, uh, arm, he's not able to do anything. And this was the post-operative. So you have very good results. If you do a uh, uh, spinal accessory to suprascapular and a stone cell transfer, almost uh, he's able to uh, come to the near normal shoulder abduction. Then for the elbow flexion, you have Oberlin's procedure. Oberlin Things everyone is aware. All these things who uh, for the PGs, uh, these things would look uh, like um, a very scary thing. When I was a postgraduate student and um, I was given this brachial plexus, we used to get lost. No clearance of the anatomy in our head. All the nerves used to look same. So gradually you will understand that where to look for. So this is again an incision on the medial aspect of the arm. Just palpate the biceps and design your incision uh, on the medial surface, uh, medial edge of the biceps, you will enter and look for the, the first thing will be the musculocutaneous. So the musculocutaneous nerve is on the under surface of the biceps. If you have ever seen this Overlin's procedure, you will find three, four thick, thick nerves running and you will be lost. Which one is median, which one is ulnar, whether it is a cutaneous, which one is musculocutaneous. So don't go here and there. You just hold on biceps, try to go on its undersurface, look for the musculocutaneous and all the branches going inside the biceps and the in, on inferiorly, you will get the brachialis also. 
you again you will stimulate and you will see if some of the fibers are uh, contracting or not most of the time it contracts until unless the entire biceps itself is not fibrosed due to impact of trauma and then the median and the ulnar nerve you know the median nerve will be slightly lateral and the ulnar nerve will be slightly medial you can also stimulate and check and regarding the selection of fascicle initially it was uh, said that the fascicle which is supplying the fcr uh, should be fcr and fcu should be selected now there are many literature available which very clearly shows that uh, there should not be uh, any choice in the particular fascicle you can have an intraneural dissection and look for one fascicle try to stimulate it check it but you do not need to because it has been seen that what Uh, any fascicle you take there is no deficit in the area supplied by the median or ulnar nerve so you can jolly well do it you can save your time rather than going on identifying the uh, special fascicle this is one uh, photograph of my own relative whom uh, who has extended uh, upper trunk palsy in which uh, i just want to show the bulk of the biceps which he achieved after over this was at the duration of 5 months in the post operative so for this patient i was very happy that if i am doing brachial plexus i am not uh, required to refer him to any surgeon so that was a very gratifying sort of thing so now come to the extended upper trunk palsy extended upper trunk is when c7 is also involved there is no extension of the elbow or the wrist that is also lost so all the plan remains the same except for the stone <coughs> stack because if radial nerve is not working you are not able to do the so what are you will go for spinal accessory to suprastar you will be able to and for the finger extension we used to do some tendon transfer previously nowadays because of the availability of newer techniques we have also switched over to some distal nerve transfers i'll come to the advances where i'll be telling otherwise at least you go for you know all the wrist drop we do the tendon transfer from pronator teres to ecr b you go and then you take either fcr or fds for the edc so same way as you do a case of wrist drop and after the 9 months if the golden period for nerve transfer goes away you go for muscle transfer so all the brachial plexus like all plastic surgery procedure is nothing else. you know the problem you know the diagnosis 1 2 3 you know the solution So this was just a picture of um, tendon transfer patient where we have taken the pronator teres with a sleeve of periosteum, and we are going to uh, do it with extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis both. We do it with the both. So this is again the same patient in which I was showing the photograph of Oberlin. We did Oberlin's and then we did the tendon transfer. It, it is his right upper limb. So he was able to extend. He was able to extend his fingers and his hand. <coughs> in cases of global plexus injury when you have a pan brachial plexus <clears throat> the entire plexus is involved this is one of the challenging cases till now there was no more challenge and uh, not much of challenge if you are well versed with the anatomy and the technique and the patient also comes within um, correct time but pan brachial plexus the prognosis is very poor the patient is very non compliant because they also lose hope of any recovery so if they come early you go for again as spinal accessory is always there sometimes it is not there then you go for looking for other nerves you have phrenic nerve okay if a medial or a lateral pectoral nerve is spared then you can use it also as a donor nerve for elbow you have intercostal after 9 months you have to switch over to the free functional muscle transfers only then for the wrist we don't do any tendon transfer because nothing is available you simply do an arthrodesis of wrist at ganga hospital dr hari sir and all has been doing it regularly and now we also have that wrist and it gives a very good function to the hand if you do a tendon transfer or a muscle transfer for the fingers or if patient is already having some function of the finger and you do a wrist arthrodesis then the power of the grip so wrist arthrodesis is must you have to involve your orthopedicians also in your team so intercostal muscle for musculocutaneous you can practice it i have also done it because it was my teaching and training but i never got good results 
So off late for last few years, I have left using it. In the first days, I do only spinal extensity to suprastapular. I leave the elbow for the free functional restless. I'm more uh, comfortable. The patient always gets good result. Uh, my all patient gets three by five. Most of them get four by five also. So I'm happy with that. So I don't go and disturb the intercostal unnecessary. I keep them as a reserve. If a second free functional muscle transfer is required, I can use it. So uh, this is just a picture of uh, our initial cases uh, in which you can see I am using the second and the third intercostal nerve for the musculocutaneous because here you have to keep rest of the fourth and the fifth intercostal for a free functional muscle transfer also. You know, DOE's procedure, they have given in green very nicely all the protocols and the stepwise. So all the four intercostals can be used. But you should avoid using the second one because the intercostal branchial nerve, that is the cutaneous branch of the second intercostal nerve, is the only sensory supply of the patient's medial side arm. So if required, you can preserve it. If you want to use it, you can use it. This is a picture showing how do we do the trapezius transfer. So trapezius, again, it is a not very difficult one. Initially, you will find difficulty, but later on, not at all. You just have a marking starting from the anterior border of the trapezius and a curvilinear incision going to the middle of the arm, uh, encompassing the deltoid also. So what you do, you take the entire acromion process with the trapezius, the anterior fibers, the middle fibers, you take it. If anterior fibers are not available, you take the middle and the posterior fibers also. But first cut the acromion process and along with the acromion process, you elevate the trapezius and bring it to the insert, um, just split the deltoid muscle and you will go and see the um, tubercle of the humerus. So there you have to insert your uh, acromion process. If you are not taking a bone, then the uh, entire uh, attachment is not strong because it has to lift a heavy arm. So you have to give a strong attachment. So actually you make the humerus also raw with a burr or a drill, you make it raw and then you fix the acromion process with two cortical screws. Either you take a 32 millimeter or a 34 millimeter or a 30 millimeter, depending upon the length and height of the patient and the width of his so, uh, It is a monocortical. You do not engage both the cortical. Okay. And then after three months, you will get a check x ray done. Till then, the patient will have splint at least for six weeks. Splint and then you will allow some passive adduction. The president is given in a 120 degrees position. And then gradually you allow the patient to adduct. And at three months, when you get a check x-ray done, the bony union is good. Then only you remove the entire splint. So this also, we have some good results. So, uh, not all the patient gets, but uh, most of them. Get. I can say majority of them. So this was the picture on the top of the showing right upper limb, not able to elevate. This was a post-operative video. Oh. Oh, good. I, I, we get to this range of movement for all the trapezius patients. So that is enough for them. And even if you have done an spinal accessory to supraescapular, anyways, you have to go for a trapezius because you know the action of the shoulder uh, abduction, how does it take place? Like the initial movement is brought, brought by the rotator cuff muscles and then the later on the deltoid and all those those things. So you have to take care. Even your spinal accessories, you put you get only 40% maximum. 40-50%, not more than that. So have 90 degree or 100 degree after. So this was one of the patients in which we as a donor for the free functional restless muscle for elbow function. You can see the scar also. There we use third, fourth, and fifth. All the three were used. But I did not got good results. One or two cases I did because that was, again, my teaching training. I have seen that only. Uh, you can see the patient is able to do. There is contraction also. We could see the tautness of the muscle, but it was not fruitful. So, so later on, we switched over to spinal accessory as well. And this was, again, one of the reasons why we always do the spinal accessory nerve transfer to the suprascapular via posterior. Because anteriorly, we are who can act as a donor for the brassalis. 
so that is my protocol we i always go for a posterior approach and then for the gracilis i use one of the anterior branches a very distal one for the um, gracilis and uh, initially we used to keep a skin paddle also but uh, for last again couple of years i have left using a skin paddle for monitoring until and unless there is deficiency of the skin so i just keep a window uh, to for the muscle monitoring in the post operative and after 48 hours we already put us put sutures uh, uh, on table only and after 48 hours which is to use the sutures once monitoring is done because unnecessary sometimes what happens in the cutaneous paddle i'm telling you my experience literature says that you can use it you cannot you may not use it also there is a constant perforator but somehow if the perforator is mishandled during surgery and if you do not find any bleeding on pick pin pick in the post operative monitoring then unnecessary reexplorations were done which was not picked up so to avoid that until unless skin deficiency is there where we require a skin pander i do not take it so this is uh, just a patient in which uh, we did aggressively and he got a uh, 90 to 100 degrees of elbow flexion and uh, this patient later on we did wrist arthrodesis also he had some movement in his spine so he is happy his trapezius transfer was also done because he came very late so no of any nerve transfer coming to the lower trunk palsy when you have a c8 t1 so there initially again we used to do only the tendon transfers we never a uh, few years back we never uh, practiced the distal nerve transfer to be very honest uh because we do not have cadavers also and i used to attend the conference go through the literature but i could not get any good results to be seen but off later i have started uh, seeing surgeons doing this distal nerve transfer getting good results dr p s vandari sir from halwani you all are aware he is constantly doing it and publishing his results also so i also got encouraged to practice and now i have started doing it so tendon transfer you have all the tendons supplied by the um, uh, radial nerve which you can use uh, like here we have uh, used the brachioradialis for uh, i think uh, we have taken the brachioradialis and ecrl and the brachioradialis was for fpr and uh, fpl and ecrl for fdc so there i my target was only a flexion of the thumb and flexion of the finger so two tendons i wanted to um, achieve the action so these are just the patient's uh, video in which uh, you can see that they have having uh, at least results they are able to uh, have some flexion of the thumb in the second picture now coming to the advances now you have seen a patient you have diagnosed done the investigation planned the surgery done the surgery got the good results okay now fewer advances are there in which one of the advances is somsat which i have already told you that we are practicing but still many of the centers are not practicing because somsat in 2007 only he reported uh, the results uh, but uh, still a long way to go because of the anatomical uh, familiarity many are not able to do and uh, <coughs> this has come as an advance because now people are um going to do more and more so i have just included it in advance only then you have this serratus reanimation sometimes what happens that if your serratus is injured and you have a, you see the winging of scapula in the patient then there are some reports where a serratus anterior is being renervated and you can either use a, a branch of the thoracodorsal nerve Uh, to the long uh, thoracic nerve which is supplying the serratus anterior initially and you can do but i have not practiced and uh, uh, i am not seeing any indian surgeon also practicing but these are the things which you must know that uh, in west they are doing it they are getting results also so this way you can do just thoracodorsal nerve either the medial or the lateral branch you can take and you can uh, just try to neurotize the long thoracic so serratus uh, anterior reanimation is possible if you have the donors available then you have only isolated lower nerve transfer a uh, lower nerve uh, lower trunk palsy in which i show you a tendon transfer 
you have these distal nerve transmitters. So Zeng from China, he has reported uh, this nerve transfer where what they do, that the musculocutaneous branch to the brachialis. If it is only lower trunk, your upper trunk is preserved. So a branch to brachialis is taken and it uh, is actually uh, coapted to the anterior erosius. So there you can have uh, this distal nerve transfer. Initially it was not there, but nowadays even in India people are doing it. I have also started doing one or two and just waiting for the results to come. So this is only for the lower trunk patients. So a picture uh, from Dr. Bhandari sir's publication only I have taken for your reference. Uh, how do you do this transfer? Because sir has been doing for last three or four years and he's getting good results. PGs, you all know Dr. P.S. Bhandari sir, Brachial Texas sir. Okay, you will come to know once you will pass. <laughs> he's an Indian uh, uh, plastic surgeon, uh, has served for many years in army uh, hospitals and he's entirely into brachial. He has the maximum number, I think, of the reported cases for all the procedure. For the posterior approach also, from India, he was the one who reported first and also the distal nerve. So another advance which has come and which uh, in India, many plastic surgeons in Brachial Texas. The red, uh, red two SO pitch between the cervical spine. You are taking that root, going to the other side, exploring the flexor, identifying the C cell, and from there you are able to see the nerve. Nowadays, you can just neurotype the upper This is spinal tube in the red tube. Just have to make a space. Always you will find the panic nerve also if you are in that. That is also the uh, reference to the tube. There is gradually you make that space uh, for serious events. So a uh, wide brand procedure is one of them. Uh, you all must be aware. You should be aware. Again, people of the especially in young adults, uh, where they are uh, bringing it and without any nerve blood. There are other procedures also holding up, like people should show these results. Where in a case of pan brachial plexus uh, patient, he, he neurotyped the entire thing using the phrenic nerve, the contralateral C7, the spinal accessory, whatever donors is preserved in one go, he will neurotize all the paralyzed nerves. And he reports good results. So these are the contralateral C7 nerve transfers that shared in this picture without you should be available, you uh, should be aware of then one more advanced which has been more reported by the neurosurgeon. The replantation of the avals. So they have actually done it. They have reported good results. So, and it is very encouraging. I am not aware any plastic surgeon doing this. Uh, but since brachial plexus is such an area where and all uh, they take up with So anyone can. So this uh, I found uh, very interesting that what they do is that they, uh, they plant the avals better. So they actually do a partial lamina. You are aware that for cervical uh, spine, if there is a foramen, they do the lamina. So here also from the anterior, they do a lamina. They just cut the transverse and expose the protein down. Tightly they rotate. And then expose the Thought and actually go and replant the roots there directly in the place. So they have mentioned uh, in the last point, as you can see, they have reported that there was some recovery in the shoulder and the 
questions that pain alleviation or all these patients have a neurogenic pain and even after your surgery that pain that is a okay or no very common cases patient is being alleviated so you have to be aware of this history because most of the time the patient is coming with a hope that this pain will be taken you did all that there is some movement but the patient so uh, yes for their further studies is said that uh, they are also going to do some regenerative surgery and they are going to do their own thing the neural stimulating agents are there okay papamycin is there and other drug uh, which they are going to uh, actually uh, Used during the time of the implantation of this. So this is a small thing about my journey. Okay, I also conducted a workshop and I followed up with the close and very close relation. And this was important because I, I was already doing it, but I was not getting it. I went to the orthopedic. Department and the new surgeon that are you interested in doing this? Just like this, it's not an consultation because, anyways, the patients were not even coming to the good ones. They were not. Most of these patients are initially treated by the orthopedic or general. This sort of for their cases of moderate physiotherapy, one and a half years, two years is going, and then the patient comes late. So this was an awareness which was required in my system, which I did, and after that we had. Lots of patients. I can very proudly say that might be the entire radial plexus patient. So he is Dr. Dari Sir. The PGs. This might be interesting. And uh, this also a small piece of information which I want to share. I was a PG doing thesis. My journey started there, and at our times because these uh, all the clinical they are existing but not many plastic surgeons have done so it was like a uh, have a time so i was told by my seniors also that if you are going to get the brittle plexus they are going all the patients who are tackling and looking for there is dr dina so this was my initial impression also uh, but later on when i went into it i found that it is very interesting very less taken this can be taken up as earlier action and uh, to be very specific my thesis was on the all the things so i was very well versed with all types of things so gradually we got a physiotherapist who should have who is well versed with the therapy protocols of the brain in one of the initial trials that i faced a very disastrous The patient had a very good shoulder. She descended to the and uh, due to more pressure on the adduction, that entire rope could never be removed. Whatever you do, so you should have a dedicated who will work. So types of injuries in our part is mostly the back. because all our speed up bikes, all the young kids, they are getting. This high impact of trauma, and uh, these are the procedures which I'm already doing it. I shared the pictures with you also. And uh, to date, we have completed one thirty six patients. All sorts of procedures, some like wrist arthritis. I told you we have been doing this recently, and we still not successful. So, in the innovation at the <coughs> center, advances and advances. In 2022, we came across this article from India, and it was about an ipsilateral C7 fascicle transfer to the supra. So this, this was a very interesting article we got it, in which we don't need to go on the concave. I have yet not. I'm slightly skeptical uh, that patient having one side. But uh, not able to convince them that we will be operating on the other side. My patients are still. I have to put in more effort. 
So this transfer was like uh, the fascicle which is supplying the plaque. It is called the upper. The fascicle which is supplying the plaque. We actually used to identify the anterosuperior which is check the compartment. And then uh, uh, that fascicle uh, was the near one. So because we were very encouraged with uh, their reported symptoms, I also gave this thesis to one routinely. So just to have the technical thing in your hand, and you can see the testicle of the pet major arising from C and uh, it is being the neurotized to the super. This is an and this is a small video which will show how do we dissect the testicle of the you have to go up to the root. You have to look for all the roots and all the pieces. And in the middle trunk, you will be getting this vesicle. So they're just checking the contraction of the textiles as to merging the So this was just to show you. And this was the first patient on which we did last year. Though I was not convinced because of the long recovery time, again, like in the earlier <coughs> approach, but I thought that this will spare the spinal epilepsy. So let's explore it. So we got a good result. This is few months back video, which you can see two by five. Very good. Uh, and the amount of So again, the patient has come very early at three points. So we offer The patient comes late, no point. So the take home message from my side is that first thing you have to be confident of the patient. Because when you will enter, the entire thought process will be blocked and will land up very disastrous. So if cadavers are available, try to have. When we started the posterior approach for me and my faculty both were facing struggle in finding the superstructural ligament. So after one or two cases, we got to get it very fast. Then again, if you are planning a free functional muscle transfer, have two teams, not one surgeon to do, because again it will go very long, and then you have to take care of the time limit which you are going to optimize. Because this is not a muscle to cover, it is a function. So they say up to three hours, four hours also, but the golden time. So you have to get your team prepared, everything on the receiving end, okay? and then you detach the device and you take it, and immediately you must go. Initial dressings for PGs, it is important. You will be a qualified plastic surgeon one day, and you have to take care of all the no nerve transfer, no free functional will be touched by the residents and I'm not. Until I am that okay now. Because you know, the things which you uh, have in your mind as an operating system, in spite of all the good care and good will, something might get wrong. Someone will do the more of a touch thing and there will be a rest. Someone uh, uh, will like uh, while doing the dressing for the nerve transfer, they put more pressure and will just shake the joint and one more. Physiotherapy, as I have already shared, one of my very bad experiences. You are the boss. You are going to take care what physiotherapy, how frequently, how much degree of adduction you are allowing in repetitious transfer, how much degree of abduction you are uh, allowing in cases of whatever you want. Take care of the, this is very important for you. Your patient will.
sensitize the patient, so have the record and evaluate also. But obviously, a patient when sees another patient recovering from such a gets more and more motivated to undergo the rest of the surgery and the physiotherapy. And obviously, patient. most of the plastic surgeons do not pursue radial mm -hmm. surgery because there is, in spite of plastic surgeons being the most patient, because it is less rewarding, you will get to see the result after nine months. In three functional days, you will get to see the result after one year to wait till 18 months for the so during that time, you have to keep counseling the patient that this is not like a surgery of all that are separated. So entire counseling, you have to talk, talk, talk. These things you have to keep in mind. But in spite of everything, is uh, uh, again. So this slide I have uh, posted it here because of my personal interest. I am a nodal officer for critical thinking skills. I keep in this post various things. So I always think that plastic surgery, as it is a problem-solving specialty, and the critical thinking skills is also problem-solving. Plastic surgeons are the strongest critical, and even in the areas of radial flexor, you have to perform the critical thinking skill is basically to organize your thought process to make it better. You don't go half You will go step by step. So think is in the place. And it is not you who is healing the patient. It's God only. You can only treat. You cannot treat. So thank you so much. Thank you once again, all the faculty, Dr. Victoria, Dr. and everyone and all the PGs and all the other offline, online. Thank you so much. Wonderful journey starting from the thesis to current position you have, madam. It's a really wonderful time, journey and congratulations. Congratulations and uh, thank you for uh, not only encouraging but very motivational talk, I would say, because uh, two bees are always neglected in one. One is gone and second is the brachial plexus. People think it is difficult. Actually, nothing is difficult if you go very systematically, right from the casualty to discharge. Results are in your hands, but patience is required and uh, no substitute for uh, discipline and the correct approach. And the approach which you have shown right from the examination to advances is the right way. And then publish or perish, as rightly you have shared that. Uh, so, before I take the questions, I am giving comments about the speaker that uh, Madam has taken a very good uh, lecture and it was very informative for all of us, including residents. And I'm sure uh, our Dr. Dinesh, uh, who is the pioneer in brachial plexus here in Gifmar, and in spite of the difficult journey and the clinic, which he has started the hand clinic. He is going very smoothly and doing a wonderful job here. And uh, today he is busy in the space, so he has joined online. Uh, with this, I uh, will go to the next part of the session. And uh, here I would like to see the chat box. Already the moment you started uh, uh, your talk, a lot of uh, good comments had already come, Madam, to congratulate you. So thank you once again from all the uh, Participants who have given the good comments for the madam, and of course there was some initially uh, audio problem, but uh, madam raised her volume and we increased the audio part. Everything got perfect, and then Dr. Mahapatra also added the YouTube link. Thank you, Dr. Mahapatra. Technology is still struggling in India. And uh, what about the nerve transfer for Anna now? This question is by Dr. 
Namatha Madam. So, Madam will take the wireless mic and focus the camera to Madam. So, Madam, this question is there. What about the nerve transfers for unknown nerve? What would you like to do? And sometimes the, the nerve to a uh, spine to is used to uh, unitize the other nerve. So if the uh, radial nerve is functional in case of the uh, lower trunk palsy, I talked about the middle nerve, but other nerve can be taken care of the right nerve to supervise the pain. And uh, Professor Sunil Narayan is the a senior professor of uh, neurology in general surgery. With him, we have done conduit um, conduit publication with me. I remember, and sir is pioneer in the neurology work, and he is also giving a very positive comments for your talk. And thanks for familiarizing us in this ongoing work and achievement. I have two important questions. One is. Uh, a flexor muscle to extensor transplantation. Which movement that the patient must mentally will do will to extend the elbow flexion of the wrist or extension of the wrist? What would you say, madam? So I think that once to ask that the wrist extension is so when we are transferring extensor muscles from the extensor, especially in the forearm, uh, many a times so uh, we are looking at the other fingers. We are taking the flexor distorted so that we call us about the ring finger and the ring finger and the to get the action of the senses of the insulation. There, uh, like we are asked to uh, uh, counsel the patient to do the extension of the wrist only. And along with that, he should to actually uh, do uh, for the elbow that should be in the middle position or maybe in some amount of motion. Like the skill which we do after the pending transfer, we actually uh, keep the elbow in the piece. Wrist in 30-30 and the pencil is in the maximum extension. Whenever we are doing the extension transfer for the wrist and the fingers extension, we are using that pencil. So that is kind of in the middle of the mental position. And also our uh, Dr. Sri Narayan. Uh, it, yeah, another question. So he did it with me in meta analysis of uh, because our department is doing a lot of regenerative procedures, making this scaffold and the content. So he analyzed with me, and according to the literature, uh, it was mainly the sensory improvement when you did the RCT based review. What do you think, madam? Is it a, a bias or uh, any, any idea about conduits or? Uh, Okay. Uh, I, uh, I can't hear madam's answering uh, clearly. I can hear uh, Professor Chitoria's uh, comment, but the, that hand mic uh, is not being captured well. So I'm not able to hear madam's answer. If, uh, Professor Chitoria, can you just uh, give us gist of what madam answered? Uh, that hand mic is not being picked up in the uh, Zoom link, Zoom platform. Can you, can you Hello? Yeah, madam, you speak, I can hear. Uh, Madam's mm -hmm. answer from the hand mic is not being picked up uh, in the uh, Zoom platform, uh, whereas uh, uh, the other, uh, where we could hear the speak, uh, talk very well, uh, but right now, from the hand mic, it's not being picked up. Okay. So if Dr. Chitori can but give it this of uh, what uh, Madam answered, that will be. No, I think I'm. Yes, I mean, 
So as I uh, mentioned that after uh, uh, we have done the uh, spinal accessory nerve transfer to supraspinal, the maximum movement achieved is 40 to 50 degrees of abduction. So for the patients who desire for more abduction, uh, sometimes the patients say that uh, I am not happy with this much. Then we go for a trapezius transfer. And we have not encountered any problem at all because the, the nerve transfer is away from the area of the muscle uh, which we are elevating for the trapezius transfer. So we have not encountered any problem. Rather than in the post-operative period, there is achievement of approximately 90 to 100 degrees of abduction. So both the procedures, that's why I'm saying key. If you will require to achieve more than 40 degree abduction, you have to go for a prestigious transfer, even if you have performed a successful nerve transfer. Okay, this was the last question in the chat box. Physically, those who are present, if any PG or other participants have any question, you can raise. Otherwise, we'll go to the next part of the session. Screenshot. Yes, on the screenshot. Give the mic. One screenshot of this image. Give other quarters, right? aware of uh, all these uh, procedures like stringer pedroplasty and all these are the pedigal procedures where you can achieve some amount of finger flexion with these procedures also. It and practically also even uh, will accept with me that the gracilis uh, achieves more range, more uh, power of the finger flexion which is desirable in the finger hands of that patient. So uh, there are procedures mentioned, but their results are not that comparable. So always, if possible, go for our gracilis only. And that too, gracilis. Okay. I'm a very uh, strong proponent of gracilis. It's not healthy. No. So Dr. Surin Narayan has uh, congratulated you, madam, once again for the wonderful talk. And uh, there's another question from Dr. Panadian, uh, Madam's experience regarding cross C7 transfer. What would you say? So, Dr. Nilayakar said, good evening. And as I mentioned uh, in my talk also, that I am personally not doing a contralateral C7 transfer till now. I am encouraged with all the reports <coughs> shown in the literature and uh, all the brachial plexus surgeons who are showing in the conferences, brachial bone and uh, and then the ice business form. So I'm planning, but uh, I do not have any experience with the contralateral C7 transfer till now. Thank you, madam. So, okay, ma'am. Thank thing? you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Vijay Kumar from Pondicherry Institute of Medical Sciences would like to ask. I would like to ask. 
<clears throat> what is your experience of in the nerve roots for uh, periodization? <clears throat> Sometimes on exploration, we do find some good nerve roots like C5. So what is your experience? Because in our hands, we also don't have an interoperative SSCP to assess whether it's working or not. So with our uh, uh, intra uh, operative clinical experience, we go and do, but it doesn't work. So I just want to ask about your experience. Because we, I mostly use SSCP and SSN, I see it to MCN. And sometimes if the C5 or C6 group appears okay, we do and put it to the posterior division, but it doesn't come. So finally, it's about the intraoperative somewhat of the potential and uh, getting to know whether it So do you have the uh, experience? So we also do not have this cortical um, uh, potential equipment in our OD. And uh, that's why we are not going into that uh, um, root uh, transfer sort of thing because uh, the patients, but we also have to take care. I mean, my section on the patient's mentality. They are very uh, willing only if they get some risk. So I don't want to take chances. So that is to be on the safer side. I do all these diseases which I mentioned. Have you done any study wherein um, you have done only SA into SSN without sound side and seen the results? Because you know, like Ganga is more towards SA into SSN. They don't do some side. Yeah. No, Ganga is doing that. Yeah. No, no, it's doing actually. Uh, like so couple of years have, because yeah. yes, we all have switched over to the combination of songs that recently yeah. that's what I mentioned also. Initially, all their cases with only one nerve transfer for shoulder yeah. adoption. And uh, I showed you one of the results from that patient right. also in anterior approach. We only went for a spinal accessory to super scapular. So there also you get comparable results. Uh, you get the comparable results, but again, as I told, that 40, 50 percent, 50 degree maximum abduction will be achieved. But if you will combine SOMSAC, you will go more than 90. So that is the benefit. So upper term, now SOMSAC inclusion is a protocol because you have the radial now pair. So why not using it? Thank you, Madam. I think we had a very good uh, interaction and the questions which are pertinent to. Uh, practically to be surgeon. So with this, uh, we'll move on to the next part of the session. Now it is the time to uh, thank our speaker. And I request our actually uh, Professor Riji to uh, give a moment to Madam. And I request Madam to come on the uh, in front of the camera also and also for, for both sides. Because so we have a telecast camera plus we have a physical so camera. Stand up. <laughs> <laughs> First physically, then remotely. <laughs> Take the photo. Now turn one again. Thank you. Now I request Dr. Mahapatra to also give a one citation to Madam. Oh, Dr. Vijay Kumar, please come. Are we all here? Because we are all Pondicherry. <laughs> it is on the behalf of here, Pondicherry passes the club. Very dynamic. Yeah, yeah. Come, come, come. See, it is nice to all of you to come here and do it. Hey, make me, 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 make Now we have uh, another one for Dr. Geetna. There are physical participants here. 
who would like to take a photo and also their certificate of participation and those who are participating remotely definitely we are going to send uh, on uh, by the registered by email the pdf copy so i request dr triji and dr reena and dr mahapatra on behalf of department to hand over physically so with this dr bharat bharat is our no. and dr jacob is our exam guru when are the exams When the day they join, actually exam starts. <laughs> Practical exam is missing. I I tell them I tell them the day you have joined, actually exam starts. <laughs> okay. Today I told them. No, that I have already told them. So uh, there is some time we are going to have the next course in the month of November. So they don't have exam in the near future. They can participate as well. Doctor Bharat, Bharat to. डॉक्टर जैकब डॉक्टर भरत प्रकाश डॉक्टर भरत प्रकाश ज्वाइन फ्रॉम आंध्र प्रदेश डॉक्टर अमृता डॉक्टर अमृता इज फ्रॉम केरला डॉक्टर भारत प्रकाश अमृता रेजिडेंट कैन कम वन बाय वन टेल योर नेम डॉक्टर प्रवीण सचिन डॉक्टर सचिन Yeah, we have uh, uh, in Jupmar uh, two thousand five hundred. Huh? <laughs> All their interested in processes. Oh my God! <laughs> Madhu, <laughs> Madhu <laughs> Doctor Madhu. Orthopedic. Ah, so orthopedic. Yeah, that is what. Second Texas. Yeah, that is what. Any other left physically? Ah, uh, other. Are you strong? Aims Patna. Aims Patna. Usually. Yes. Must you like, madam? Sixteen batches. Yeah. Others will be. Doctor, doctor, <laughs> doctor Anand. Doctor Anand. Usually, all they all. Anyone left? Okay. Others will be given for the practical purpose. Uh, we have uh, uh, distributed the. And now I request uh, Doctor Napatra to give vote of thanks. <laughs> मापात्रेटिंग And, I hope um, it was not too long. No, no, no. Like five years. Classically, time is not enough. Then I thank all the participants who have come here physically, and being a holiday also they came, and all our members of Pondicherry uh, Plastic Surgery Club, Meghna, um, Vijay, and Parma, they are all here. I am very thankful. All the members of the IT Telemedicine uh, wing, Professor Chakuri is the head of Telemedicine, so I am very really thankful for organizing. Then other members of Plastic. Actually, Dr. Anand, our chief of promoters, our staff from uh, Wards, we are really thankful to all of you for joining us in this program. I thank all members uh, of Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry Plastic Surgery Association, South India Zone of Plastic Surgery, Appraso, the Appraso uh, Zone of Orissa, the East Zone Plastic Surgery, who have joined us uh, online, Professor Nilayapar, Dr. Jayaraman, and I am really grateful for uh, bearing with us with the initial lectures and staying uh, and uh, attending. During neurology, neurosurgery, and uh, orthopedics, who have uh, attended this talk, thank you very much, everybody. With this, I would like to thank all uh, one and all, and we will be continuing similar programs in future also. Thank you very much.
request all of you to arrive for the national anthem, which will be followed by a group photograph of the department. Thank <laughs> you. 